I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, R.M. Krikatil is a master storyteller who skillfully crafts an intriguing narrative set against the backdrop of the medical world, where his hero struggles not only with the intricacies of pathology, but also with his emotional anchors and complex relationships. The name of this amazing book is called The Dead Shall Teach the Living, and the author weaves a complex tale of mystery, morality, and romance. We're delighted to have this author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Prime 7 Media for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel. Ravi, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you very much, John. This is Logan Crawford who, for inviting me. It's a great honor and privilege to be um, interviewed by one of the legends in the business. And Thank you, I take this Thank opportunity you. to uh, express my thankfulness to you and your team, including Mr. George Williams. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. You're a very talented writer. This is an amazing book. Let's tell the folks at home the big picture first. What is the book about? The book, um, I had this idea when I was uh, training as a pathologist. And um, it's an original idea, um, which I thought I should write uh, about. So this happens in the world of pathology and autopsy. And the pathology or pathologist training is in an outback town of Australia, remote, far from the madding crowd and far from civilization. He is new from India and he has this cultural shock when he arrives in India. He sees people who act like they are friendly, but he is not sure. And then he falls sick and then there is some terrible tragedy happening when his wife visits him on a surprise visit in, in the morning, early morning, he's found unconscious. Now, the protagonist, um, Raj, believes that somebody tried to kill him, but nobody wants to believe it. Everybody thinks or everybody stresses, including his wife, thinks it's a suicide attempt because he has enough reasons to try to commit suicide. Um, so Raj, the protagonist, tries to get help from the police who just um, ignores him. So he solicits his wife's help. Can you stay back and help me find out what's happening? I'm not going to run back to India where we came from. This is not what we came for. We came here to stay um, in Australia. Um, and although my life is in danger, I want your help to watch my back and together we'll get to the bottom of this um, intriguing mystery. Fascinating. Tell me a little bit about how your own real life story intertwines with this narrative. Yeah, the idea is um, from my experience, I cannot tell what that is. But when I came to Australia uh, 23 years ago, 24 years ago, I was new to this country and I felt lonely. And um, there were Australia is a wonderful people with very friendly people. Even then, you are lonely in this place. Um, and you come across people who you work with and I've tried to make them look funnier, look uh, more villainous than they really are, to weave those characters into the story. Um, and they uh, give strength to the characters in the story as well as the intense feeling of loneliness and solitude makes the protagonist seek help from 
the nature surrounding him. He thinks one of the mountains, a mountain close to the hospital where he is working, is an Aboriginal elder and he seeks his advice and comfort and talks to him when he has trouble. Um, so that's where the story starts and um, he chases the wrong, chases several leads and finally he finds out what is happening and in between there are a lot of, there is a lot of action, there's a lot of comedy, there's a lot of um, mind, uh, thought provoking uh, proverbs which are woven into the, um, the, into the story. Yeah, yeah, there's many layers there. That's what makes the book such an interesting read. Um, let me ask you, is there something by writing this book you wanted readers to know? Was there a message you were sending out? Yeah, um, the main message I think is the integrity and steadfastness of the protagonist in the face of um, severe adversities. Um, that's the main message. The other message is the story of mystery where the characters are real. They are not, I never would like to write a story of a person who tried to save the universe or save the world. This is a very um, down to earth story of things which can happen in the real world. It's not uh, out of the world uh, story, it's very, very real and it can happen. Um, it can very well happen. And um, so that's the kind of story that I wanted to tell. The other thing which I wanted to tell was the proverbs which are from my language. I wanted to show the beautiful culture of. Uh, our place and uh, the language um, is uh, a language uh, one of the languages of um, India is called Malayalam and it's a very rich language with lots of um, um, literature and the proverbs are the proverbs which I grew with which my mother and my father used to tell me at several occasions and this had these had a role in develop my, developing my character I feel these are being lost uh, with the new generation because uh, people do not try to learn our language uh, these days so much uh, because of the corruption and um, problems there people want to get out. So the language is losing its, um, um, its value amongst the younger crowd. That's what I feel, it may be wrong and I have a feeling that this is there is a danger of the language uh, completely disappearing in a few hundred years time so i wanted to show to the world the rich culture uh, that we had um that is the other thing the next thing is uh, uh, this protagonist though he has problems he has um enemies um uh, which he thinks is trying to get rid of him. Finally, he finds out the truth and finally he forgives everybody and tries to save the same people he thought were his enemies or are being difficult with him. So it's a, also a story of um, forgiveness and uh, compassion. Tell us what the title of the dead shall teach the living means. Yeah, um, as uh, doctors and especially as pathologists, we work with dead people. Uh, we work with uh, living people also, but uh, one of our main uh, part of our work is uh, doing autopsies. So the, these autopsies can be medical autopsies or legal autopsies. In either case, we derive knowledge from the dead people. They, they teach us when we do the autopsy, when we um, slice open the body, when, you look, when we look at the body, they are actually coming into life and telling us more about medicine and uh, that's um, 
more and more about themselves but also uh, about medical science so um, that's uh, because this um, story is or the novel is um, about multiple autopsies um, I have put this name um, which means the dead people are teaching us when uh, we do these uh, postmortems. Very, very interesting. Tell me how Raj's cultural background influences his experiences while in Australia. Yeah, Raj um, comes from a southern state in India. Um, we back home in India, we are or religious, we belong to one religion or the other. He is um, a Christian, uh, which you might find the, the viewers around the world might find it a bit strange, but uh, Kerala Christians are some of the most ancient Christians in the world. We believe we were made Christians by one of the 12 disciples of Jesus in the first century. So, and um, Raj has worked in um, a big um, Christian institution and where a lot of um, missionary doctors work. So Raj has the belief that all white people are like the missionary doctors, uh, sacrificial, honest, um, um, you know, uh, with all the virtues you can think of. That's the idea he has when he comes to Australia. That all white people are like like the missionaries whom he knows. Because he hasn't dealt with non-missionary white people. But he comes and sees and to his um, shock, he finds that that's not the case. Um, these people have the same problems that you have back at home, although in a different way. So he tries to deal with, deal with these issues. Um, the cultural issues, the poverty, the lack of uh, infrastructure, all strike him like a blast of hot, humid air, which you get in the Northern Territory, Northern Australia. Um, that's one thing. And then he sees all these beautiful malls, the beautiful buildings, the beautiful roads, but people are the same, whether it's in India, they have the same problems, they have the same weaknesses. And um, so it was a learning curve slowly to understand that people wherever they are, are probably the same with only slight differences. At one point in the book, you know, Raj suffers a sudden illness. What's the significance of that in the storyline, Raj, uh, Raj's sudden illness? Now, the illness um, is um, severe abdominal pain with jaundice. Now, this can be caused by multiple things, but one of the things which we think of when you have jaundice and severe abdominal pain and abdominal pain together is a cancer of the pancreas. Now, cancer of the pancreas is invariably fatal. Hardly anybody uh, survives once diagnosed because the diagnosis is usually made late. So Raj has this terrible illness which he is most likely to die of. So he has enough reasons plus he has problems at work, severe problems with his boss who doesn't like him. Um, with his um, co-workers, the technicians in the mortuary who tries to bully him. So he is surrounded by adversities, his own personal health, the people around him. So these give him enough reasons 
to try to end his life. So this uh, illness has a very significant, significant role in, in the story. One of his boss is quite eccentric in the book. Why did you choose to portray him like that? I mean, uh, I've seen such people in the pathology world. They think people, normal people, not people outside pathology think we sit with microscope and slides from throughout our life. Uh, so we, they think of us as different people who are introverts who uh, don't belong to the normal world because we, we sat, sit by ourselves looking at the slides, making diagnosis, sending the report. We don't, they think that we don't like people. That's not always the case. Always the case. Um, I, I chose uh, pathology as my career because I was intrigued by the idea of uh, making the final diagnosis. Um, I, I like that uh, thinking uh, when everybody says this could be this, this could be that, this could be this, we say this is this. Although we don't take part in treating the pe people, uh, it, it gave me great pressure to think I could make that final uh, diagnosis. So. People think of us as different, which is not the case all the time. Like, we are normal pe people. Uh, we are as normal as anybody else. But the, the boss here is one of the people Raj comes across as different, as, ex 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 um, as a different person. And he he thinks the boss is out to get him because the boss believes that Raj, the protagonist, knows something about him which uh, puts uh, his reputation in danger. Because Raj has this belief that somebody is trying to kill him, he looks around and sees enemies all around him. They, may not, they are not his enemies, they are just people who are going about with their lives. But this is this feeling that these, all these people are out to get him. Uh, to weave such a story, I had to make these characters uh, interesting and uh, different. So uh, I had added bits and pieces to make them um, uh, different. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. How do the themes of good and evil play out in your novel? I mean, if um, good doesn't succeed, there's no point in writing the book. Now, the good, uh, which uh, the protagonist aims for and tries to make make friends. He finds amongst his local company um, the people around him only a few people, um, and those people are workmates. And then he thinks there is a friend outside the workplace, which is a mountain. Uh, he's so lonely that he starts talking to the mountain and he thinks it's an Aboriginal elder who shares some of the sadnesses or which he has a um, much more um, sad story because a lot of the Aboriginals were killed um, by the colonizers. So he finds something in common with the mountain uh, who he thinks is an Aboriginal elder and he starts talking to him and he has um, he is the um, 
you know, the perfect example of a compassionate uh, elder figure. Now the bad people are surrounding him and also in nature he there is an ugly huge gum tree which he thinks is the embodiment of uh, all the evil in the world. So he hates that uh, tree. He tries to avoid it in darkness. He walks takes a different route when he goes home uh, from work, which he walks because he is staying in the same campus. Um, so I've, I've, I've tried to bring this um, struggle between good and evil and in the end, of course, um, the good um, succeeds. Yeah. Absolutely, I think you've succeeded with that for sure. Tell me what, was this your first novel? Tell me what it was like writing this book. I, writing was my, is my greatest passion. In fact, one of the reasons I took pathology as a, pro, as a career was I thought I'll get lots of time to write because I don't have to answer calls, but that's not the case. I am at my lab all the time. Anyway. Um, so I had hit upon this idea, which is original, and I thought I should write. And uh, I started writing and because I had no previous experience, I had to weave the story and I have to make it, make the suspense there, uh, which was difficult because everybody thinks he, the, the, the big danger that Raj was in, where he was found unconscious, that he was trying to kill himself. So to weave suspense into a story where people cannot believe that there was any um, any attempt at murder was difficult but I think I've succeeded in it by doing it um, and again without uh, experience it was difficult to write a mystery book to lead the reader um, in circles um, it took me close to 20 years to write the book uh, one of the reasons is I wasn't experienced. The other thing was the story was difficult to make suspense. The third thing was I was busy. So I would write sometimes for three months, email it to myself. Then after a few months, maybe one or two years later, I will pick it up and start writing again. All the while I was in the back of my mind, I would be thinking about the next next page, next step. So much so that the 18 years wasn't a waste, I think. It was, it's like a wine which has aged for 18 years. So it brings out my 18 years in Australia into a condensed 200 odd pages of book, which is very real, I think. So, although my output um, hasn't been prodigious like most others, I believe in that small book, I've condensed my life, um, what I thought slowly, even without my uh, inten intending to do that, it has come into the book uh, very slowly, uh, like the the oak cask leaching into the wine. Uh, I think uh, it has um, only improved uh, the quality of the book. That's my belief. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It took a lot of years writing this book, and uh, you developed just a wonderful, wonderful story, a wonderful, wonderful narrative that sometimes takes years to develop. Before we leave today, anything you'd like our viewers to know? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so one one thing which um, happened to me, which is very similar to the things which happened to Raj, but much more serious. Um, this happened about 10 years ago. I was working in a hospital where I saw mistakes made by my colleagues. One of these people was working with me. The other person I've never ever seen or come across. Because we have to store our slides for 10 years at least. We can always go back and pick up. So I had doubts about a, a pathologist who I've never met with. And I saw multiple serious mistakes. And also mistakes committed by one of the people who was working with me. And uh, I mentioned this, this to my boss who warned me that if I make any formal, any, any complaint, he said he will use the complaint against me. Now, I was not talking about um, personality issues. I was talking about serious, very serious issues which had life and death um, problems which can cause life and death uh, in, in the community. Now, I had to uh, email my boss what happened because the, the mistakes which I thought were mistakes. Now, when I think somebody makes a mistake, it doesn't mean that they are mistakes. It has to be corroborated with other people. I had to email my boss uh, the list of cases which I thought were mistakes committed by these people. After I do that, I, had, I went on holidays a month later and when I came back, I was uh, taken to the admin office and given an order to go on administrative leave. I said, why? So when I was away, the same person who I had complained about came from Adelaide and had investigated me. And uh, based on his investigation, I was asked to go on admin leave. Now, I thought that was so strange because I make a complaint about somebody and that person makes comes and investigates me. So, I, I had no other option and uh, I was put on administrative leave and uh, uh, a few weeks later, the hospital decides that the College of Pathologists will do a thorough investigation on me. A few months into the so-called investigation, a colleague a clinical colleague whom I met on the street told me the person who investigated me, that pathologist, was responsible for two women having the breast removed um, with a misdiagnosis of cancer which he made. So this pathologist made a diagnosis of cancer, made diagnosis of cancer in two women when they actually didn't have cancer and they had their breast removed. This happened in one, one month after I had I was suspended so I was telling them the same thing uh, that this is very bad there's some big issue this and in fact when I went on leave the last day on my going on leave I went to my boss's office and said I, I, I came to know that this man was coming to replace me uh, in during my leave I told him it's very dangerous to have him here I have seen his work, but and then when I came back, I was um, uh, suspended from work. So I had, I was under severe stress because this is my life, my, my bread and butter. This is the bread and butter of my family, and uh, to be told after years and years of study, I studied medicine, I studied pathology back home in India, in India, the biggest, the most famous. Uh, Indian institutions. Then I came to Australia and redid all those studies again, did, did all the exams, and then being told that your professional ability is not good enough. That was so shocking. And all the investigation carries a bit of luck. So I was under so 
much stress. My family, my wife was under a lot of stress. My attitude towards my family, my children, everything changed uh, because I, I was wrong and the way my, I behaved changed. Um, and when I heard this, I was, I was so sad because this could have been avoided, these two women having the pressure mood. I, I, I rang the regulatory body and told them, see this happened, please confirm this. And four days later, I ring them again and they said, they confirm the news, but they think it is a random event. Nobody other than myself informed them and nobody took any action. There wasn't even a cautionary note against his name in the list of uh, doctors. I used to check every month. Now, I was completely exonerated after a lengthy investigation, which the investigation report, um, the final report I've sent uh, across, uh, which uh, puts to rest any doubt about my um, competency. So, this was total nonsense. I was out of work. I didn't work for one and a half years. I made complaints to every government institutions in Australia, every single institution, all of them were covered up. No action was taken. All his other reports, all his other diagnoses were not rechecked by somebody else. No, nothing happened. Finally, when I found out that nothing is happening, I went to the biggest um, Australian news um, um, caster, uh, I'm not telling the name, and they came to my lab, they interviewed me for one and a half hours. When this was going on, when this news team was in Darwin, I got an invitation from the minister's office, please can you come and see me? So I went there, went there with a friend of mine, I thought at least they will do something, because this was not about something which happened to me. This was something which is happening to the community, which I was talking to them. Yeah. And they were, Absolutely. yeah, I went there in the parliament. I went to the office and the ministers, minister wasn't there. Uh, her advisor was there, PA was there. They were very rude to me. I don't know why they invited me. They asked me to get out. When this news was brought out, it came out about the two women and they're having their mastectomies for no reason. But what happened in the background that this could have been avoided and the person who tried to warn was thrown out um, into the street. Nothing, none of those uh, came out. Um, I've been to multiple, uh, multiple journalists, multiple news outlets, but nobody, they, they told me point blankly, nobody is going to do this, Ravi. I have no idea. I've, I found it so strange and so sad. The person who was responsible is enjoying, had a promotion after that. Um, he, now, when this kind of news comes out, you should take moral responsibility and say, now I'm not fit for this. But this person was directly responsible for what happened. And uh, he is, um, I'm so sad to say this, but um, he is being protected by everybody around, including yeah. people in the, in the government. And so uh, I, I had no other place where I hope when I talk to George, is there any way that this very serious news can, because I know people of color like Indians uh, from the subcontinent who are being hounded by the regulatory body, who cannot practice, who haven't been practicing. One of my friends for a small thing, he hasn't been practicing for years. I know of other people who've been, who are being hounded for small things for several years. And when this happens to an Australian who there is no not just harm, there's no problem. He's allowed to continue to practice 
uh, causing misery that we, we cannot say how many people's lives has been affected. Amazing. It is an amazing story for sure. I, we appreciate you uh, telling us. And uh, it affects not only you personally, but society as a whole, like you mentioned. Um, this book that you've written is a wonderful book as well. It is called The Dead Shall Teach the Living. It's a wonderful read. It's a fascinating story. It's rooted in reality and uh, it is highly recommended. Ravi, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you, Edwin. My pleasure. The honor is all mine. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time. And this time, until next time.